about 10 years ago when Julie and I were working through the process of Micah's documentation, our younger son, uh, I needed to communicate with a certain governmental agency, and I did so by email, explaining our situation, explaining Micah's situation, and asking how we should proceed. So a couple days later, I received an email back, and it was very clear that whoever responded to this email either had not read my email or had not understood it. So I sent another email back and this time the email was longer. And the pertinent points were all in caps. And I wanted to emphasize that over and over and over again. Uh, This process went on for three or four email exchanges until finally Whoever this was on the other end understood what I was trying to communicate. The sermon series that we're going to start today is based in part upon this kind of situation. John, the apostle, wrote five books of the New Testament. He wrote the gospel that we know of today as the gospel of John. He wrote the book of Revelation. And he wrote three letters or epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Now, 3 John was specifically written to one individual, an acquaintance or friend of John's, a man, and he wrote that expressing some personal issues, and so that was a much more personal letter. 1 and 2 John, however, were both written to a church, to a specific church. Just to confuse us, 2 John was written first. And 1 John was written second, okay? Uh, The order of the books in the canon are not necessarily inspired by God, okay? The content of each book is inspired by God. The order is not. We're not sure exactly why we've come to number them 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John in their particular order, but they're not chronological. But what happened is John the Elder was over, had a position of spiritual authority over a certain number of churches in a given geographical area. In at least one of those churches specifically, John was made aware of theological and doctrinal error that was sneaking, that was creeping into the church. And there were people that were intentionally teaching these errors, things we might call today heresies. And so John wrote to the church to address these issues. He wrote the letter of 2 John first. The letter of 2 John is short. It's actually the shortest book in the Bible. Easily readable in just a minute or two. Apparently, that letter did not have the desired effect. Because then we receive 1 John, which deals with the same basic issues, but in much deeper attention. And that's how we're going to be looking at these two letters over the coming weeks. We're going to examine 2 John first, almost as a template or an introduction to 1 John. This morning, I'm actually going to read the, I don't get to say this very often, so I'm going to say it. This morning, I'm going to read the entire book of 2 John. And I'd like to invite you to follow along with me if you have your Bibles with you, remembering that we're looking at this particular letter as a simplified outline and introduction to the book of 1 John. This is the first letter that John sends to this particular church. He's drawing their attention to these specific errors that are creeping in. And then when apparently the desired response is not achieved, he sends 1 John in which he elaborates and fleshes out his arguments more clearly and more deeply. 2 John chapter, because there is no chapter 1. It's just 2 John. The elder, to the chosen lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth, which lives in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son, 
will be with us in truth and love. It has given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as the Father commanded us. And now, dear lady, I am not writing you a new command, but one we have had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. Many deceivers who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh have gone out into the world. Any such person is the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch out that you do not lose what you have worked for, but that you may be rewarded fully. Anyone who runs ahead and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not take him into your house or welcome him. Anyone who welcomes him shares in his wicked work. I have much to write to you, but I do not want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. The children of your chosen sister send their greetings. John, at this point in his life, is elderly. And if we think today that international travel is tiring and taxing, imagine what it would have been like in John's day. Today, if there's an emergency almost anywhere around the globe, a family emergency or a situation that needs our attention, you know, we might get a little tired from an overnight flight, but it's not going to knock us for a loop, right? We're able to get almost anywhere we need to go in the world within 24 hours, flights, weather, and money permitting, okay? Now, in John's day, he's over. He has spiritual authority. He addresses himself as elder to this church, and we don't know for certain how large a geographical area it might cover, But for John to travel there and personally address these situations would have been quite a sacrifice and perhaps extremely physically taxing to him. And so he writes. And you know what? This is a blessing to us because we have what he wrote. And not just what he wrote, but many other epistles in the New Testament. We have them because transportation and instantaneous communication didn't exist then. This has to be part of God's plan, for these to be preserved for us. You know, if this had taken place on a phone call or by Skype, we wouldn't have it. We wouldn't have it. If it had been probably a quick email that John sat down and ripped off to this church, again, we probably would not have it preserved. But because of the timing historically that it came about, we do. And for that, we should thank the Lord. From the very beginning of this brief epistle, John highlights his themes. The themes that are going to be carried through the rest of 2 John and all of 1 John. And that first theme is love and truth and the relationship between the two. He addresses this church as the chosen lady. Now, if you read that the first time through quickly, you might think he's speaking to a specific woman, but he's not. He's addressing the church And that image of the church as the bride of Christ, who will be perfectly united with Christ, that's the image that he's got. And he says, you know, it's a pleasure to me to hear that some of your children are walking in the truth. And some of the children of the church, the members, are walking in the truth. And then at the end, he talks about her chosen sister, another sister church. And as John begins his address, one of the first things he says to this chosen lady, to the church he's addressing, is that he loves them. Now, that may not seem like a big deal to us. We write a letter. Well, out of curiosity, how many of you have actually written a letter in the past 10 years? Written, not typed, written. Not many. When you wrote that letter, at some point, it's possible if you were writing to a loved one or a family, you wrote the word love in there. I love you or love or querido or querida or chiomu or something like that. 
And so we read this and we think, oh, John loves them, that's great. But in context, we need to understand that the word for love that John uses was unique in this time period. So we, most of us know that in the Greek language in which this was originally written, rather than one word for love, they had at least three. John uses the word agape, which many of you have heard before, that refers to the perfection of the love of God the perfect, holistic love of God. Now today, we've become conversant with that word, even in the Greek. But to John's readers, this would have been unique. That was not the word in this time period used to describe the love between people. It was exclusively reserved for the love of God, for himself within the Godhead, within the Trinity, and also the love of God for his creation, for his people. So John's doing something a little bit shocking in applying the love of God between him and this church, between him and other people. Agape love was reserved for God alone, but now it's being used between people. And John doesn't stop there. He says, he, he describes the way he loves them. He says, to the chosen lady and her children whom I love in the truth, and because of the truth. Without that little article, the, we could read this, whom I love in truth. And in old English, that would mean intensifier. It would mean I really, really love you. I love you deeply. But that one small article, the, changes that. John says he loves this church in the truth and because of the the truth. Truth in John's theology is an entity. It is living. It is absolute. It's eternal. It lives in himself and it lives in the members of this church to whom he's writing. And the fact that the truth lives in him and lives in them, that produces love. He says he loves them because of the truth. Because is a causal word. The cause of his love for them is the truth that lives in him. And as we look further into John's theology, we're going to find that when John uses the expression, the truth, he's referring to the person of Jesus Christ. So truth to John is not something intellectual, primarily. It's not propositional. It is the person of Jesus Christ. And he says, because of Jesus Christ, who lives in me and who lives in you, I love you. I love you in Jesus Christ, who lives in me and who lives in you. Christ lives in people who believe in him. And his indwelling produces the fruit of love. Now, this interdependence of truth and love is important in John's thinking. Because the idea that he's going to want to get across is that without truth, there is no love. Without truth, there's no love. And this is one of the errors that was beginning to creep into the church, the early church. And it's in some ways, saddening to think that in such a short period of time, error was always coming, already coming into the church. I mean, we're talking here about a matter of maybe 30 years since the inception of the church, and already some of the primary pillars of truth were being attacked. To this day, I would suggest that the forces of evil and deception that are at work in the world are doing all they can to force a wedge between the two, to divorce truth from love. But truth is embodied in the person of Jesus Christ. And as the Son of God, he's the source of true love, and we can't separate the two. What the world would like to do is to take truth out of the equation, because then they are free, or we are free, to redefine love. I assume that most of you are familiar with the chemical equation H2O. 
Now, it's possible to separate the H and the O. You can do that, but then you don't have water. So you can separate them, but then you're going to have something completely different. So you can try to separate truth from love, but what you're going to end up with is not love. And John has not yet explained what the signs of love are. That's coming later. But for now, we can talk about this attempt to separate love from its foundation in truth. The world would like to recast love as a feeling of goodwill toward others. And, you know, we talked about this briefly back in Mark, that we would like to define the word love as niceness. That... uh, And so when we think of that word, oh, love, we think just nice. Everyone being nice to each other, which I think would be a good thing. I think that would be good for us all to be nice to each other. But I don't think that that gives an adequate definition to what love is. Love, as the world would define it, never judges. It never judges, except to judge those who judge. Love affirms everything and everyone. Love holds human choice above all other virtues. And love never, ever says that anything or anyone is wrong. Except to say that telling someone else they are wrong is wrong. That is wrong. I don't know if you could follow that. But John's argument is that true love can only flow out of absolute truth as revealed in Christ. Because without Christ, we don't even know what love is. Friends, affirming someone's sin or encouraging them to engage in self-destructive behavior is not loving. Uh, I tried to imagine the worst possible life-threatening allergy that someone could have and I decided it would be an allergy to coffee. So if you had a friend or an acquaintance or a family member who had truly a life-threatening allergy to coffee, it would not be loving of you to affirm their desire to drink coffee. It would not be loving of you to offer them opportunity to drink coffee. And even more so if this were... in in the context of a medical care individual, a physician or a doctor, who caring for this person, knowing that they had this condition, and yet never telling them and simply affirming their desire to drink, to partake, which of course is a good desire. But if we affirm that to those people, would that be loving? When we think about that in a physical context, all of us easily and quickly can say, no, of course that would not be loving. You would be encouraging that person's self-destruction. And yet, when we talk about it in the context of what is right and wrong, based upon the word that God has given us, his will, suddenly we redefine things and we say, well, no, 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 when it comes to issues of sin or when it comes to issues of the Bible, who am I, who am I to speak? Who am I to judge? That's not loving. Now, we do have to remember that Scripture also says to anyone who would engage in this kind of confrontation that we are to speak the truth in love. And that has to do with motives. It's not out of a desire to wound or injure or harm or in some ways um, get revenge upon another person but it's with the intent of protecting them, of bringing them forgiveness and repentance and goodness. True love speaks the tough reality. Hiding it, covering it, being ashamed of it, refusing to speak out of fear of giving offense is not love. That is not love. Love cannot be divorced from the truth. Without truth, we don't even know what love is and we have no no idea what love does. So thank God that he has revealed the truth in Jesus Christ and that he lives in those who believe. Now this theme, love and truth and their interdependence, will be fleshed out more fully both in 2 John and 1 John, but today is just an introduction. 
The second theme that John addresses is the theme of the deity and incarnation of Christ. He blesses his readers with three virtues in verse 3. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son. Isn't that a little bit of an awkward wording? We would probably smooth that out, or that would be the tendency and say to say something like, from God the Father and from Jesus the Son. But John intentionally words it slightly awkwardly. From God the Father and from Jesus Christ the Father's Son. This emphasis is intentional. From the opening lines of the short letter, John highlights the divinity and the sonship of Jesus Christ. And as we continue through these epistles, it's going to become clear that this particular church was being influenced by an early heresy that denied both the full deity of Christ, saying that Jesus was not fully God, and a related heresy which stated that God never took on human flesh. In other words, that the incarnation never happened. God never became human. And these two heresies, which are related, are seen by many scholars as a forerunner to what we call Gnosticism or early Gnostic thought and and heresy, which we will also deal with a little later. But these subversions are still very present in our world today. But for now, note the emphasis and the foundation John lays. These blessings, grace, mercy, peace, come from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father. Now in the Old Testament, God is referred to as Father. But in Christ, his fatherhood takes on a new significance a personal, loving relationship to the individual. Through the revelation of the Son, God is known to us as Father. And to reject the Son, or to reject the Sonship or the divinity of Christ, is to reject how God has revealed himself. It's to reject how God has revealed himself in his fatherhood. The source of the blessings of peace, grace, and mercy is the Godhead. And there's a deep danger in our attempts to deny the way that God has revealed himself. We were created in God's image. And one of the sins and results of the fall is that we set ourselves up in the place of God and we try to create God in our image. We decide that we have the authority to say what is right and wrong. And in our extreme arrogance, we say, along with the serpent in the Garden of Eden, did God really say this? Did God really say that? Did God really say that if you eat the fruit of this tree, you will die? Did God really say that? Is that really what he meant? And we put ourselves in that place of challenging the revelation of God. When John writes these letters, he's witnessing this very arrogance within the church. That which had been revealed to them about the truth and love and nature of God was being questioned. Truth was being denied. Today, we see these same tendencies. Many ideas, many points of doctrine, many pillars of theology are being questioned in our modern age because they're not comfortable And they're not popular, and oftentimes they don't feel good. We question the meaning of love. We question the foundation of love and truth. We deny truth. We try to change God to reflect our image, to make him more comfortable, to make him more the way we wish he were. Now, I want to be clear that I do not think that we should never examine or question theology doctrine, history, tradition of the church. But we should always do so firstly and primarily from the position of the word of God. So anything that we're going to question, we question based on God's word. And secondly, we do so with great humility. 
So any time that we are going to decide that the church has had it wrong for 2,000 years, we need to be very, very careful. Because essentially we'd say that God has allowed a particular error to continue within his church for that long. And that is, I'm not saying that's impossible. I'm just saying that we need to be extremely humble and cautious in making those kinds of assertions. And simply in the last 30 to 40 years, it's astonishing and in some ways terrifying to see how many foundations of the faith have been questioned, not from the perspective of the Bible, but from the perspective of culture and society. And we so easily turn our backs on what God has established and what God has revealed about himself. We do not have the right or the freedom to redefine God. We do not have the right to make him in our own image. You know what, friends? I'm going to be honest with you about something. I do not understand any of the laws in Sao Paulo governing the bus lanes. I don't know the difference between a corredor and a faixa. <laughs> Truly. And I'm, part of the reason I'm saying this is I'm hoping that someone out there does and you'll explain it to me after the service. I know supposedly, theoretically, that you can drive in some sometimes and you can drive in others no times. And that certain ones taxis can be in and certain ones they can't. And some you can be in early in the morning and late at night, night, but not in the middle of the day. There are others that you can drive in in the middle of the day, but not in the morning and not in the evening. And I really don't know. A number of years ago, a new faixa, corredor, I don't know which, was put in on an avenue near our house, an avenue that oftentimes, particularly on weekends, has bad traffic on it. And... Um, a friend of mine, someone told me, no, 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 on weekends, on weekends, any car can use that lane. And you know what? I accepted that statement because I liked it. I did not research it. I did not take even a couple minutes to Google it. I didn't ask anybody else. I just said, I heard it, and I like it, so I'm going to believe it. And, you know, I was maybe a little bit concerned that the next Saturday morning as I was zipping down the bus lane alone in the bus lane and driving by all these, you know, suckers over there who are sitting in traffic, and I was enjoying this. I'm so glad that it's legal to do this. Too bad they don't know that it's legal. And of course, you know how this story ends. You know, I received a nice letter from the municipal authorities inviting me to make a contribution into the public <laughs> coffers, you know. Um, but the point I want to say with that is I, I chose to believe that without researching it because it was pleasant to do so. It was nice. It was good. It was easy. It's what I wanted to believe, right? But... The fact that it was convenient, the fact that it was pleasant, the fact that it was what I wanted to believe did not change reality. It didn't change the truth. The truth was, actually, I don't know what the truth is, except that you can't drive in there when I did. Now, maybe later in the day, because that was the next thing I heard. No, 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 it's after 2 o'clock you can. But someone else told me it was after 1 o'clock, and I've just decided, you know what? I'm going to stay in the traffic. Because as generous as I may be, I don't want to make any more contributions. Um, so, and maybe that's a silly illustration, uh, a silly way to talk about our desire to believe what is easiest to believe or what is most convenient to believe. But it does give us a, a small, simple picture of that same desire that we have with God that whatever, whatever is easiest to believe about him or whatever is most convenient to believe about him is that which is most attractive to us. So it's easier to believe in a God that does not base love on truth. A God who simply wants everybody to be nice to everybody else and he himself is incredibly nice to us. 
and is always, you know, nice. He's just nice, and he just affirms everything and every desire you might have and every perversion that you might wish to engage in. God just affirms that because he's nice. But, but this is why God has given us his word. That's why he's given us his self-revelation. It's why he's given us Christ. It's why Jesus took on human flesh to reveal the Father in flesh and blood to us. And one of the most dangerous lies is that Jesus was not God and that God did not become human that he did not take on human flesh. And all of that can be subsumed under the heading of trying to re-image God according to what I want him to be. And so John presents to us his primary themes, love, which flows from truth, and the deity and sonship of Christ. And I invite you to join me and, and those sitting next to you and all of us on the journey that will go over through Second and First John over the coming weeks. And I want to give you a homework assignment. I want to invite you to read 2nd and 1st John together, 2nd John 1st, 1st John 2nd, in one sitting at least once this week. I timed it, I timed the reading of 1st John, I read it uh, out loud, and it took about 20 minutes. Um, so I think most of us could somehow squeeze out half an hour in our schedule to read that through. And what I would also challenge you to do is, as much as possible, as much as you are able, ignore the chapter divisions and the little headings that the NIV puts in there. They're not bad in of, of themselves, but sometimes they actually break up the flow of the thought rather than giving us the continuity that the original author intended. When you receive a letter or an email, do you read it by paragraphs? Do you take it and say, okay, um, <clears throat> Today I'll read the first paragraph, and then I'll pause. And then tomorrow, uh, well, if I get around to it tomorrow, maybe the next day, or maybe when I'm sitting on the bus in a couple days, I'll read uh, the next paragraph. And eventually, um, in the course of a month, I'll work my way through this five-paragraph letter, and I'll know what the person has said. No, we don't usually do that. So I would encourage you, this was, this was a letter. Both of these were letters. Read them at one sitting, and read them all the way through, and ask the Lord, as you do, to enlighten you that his spirit would work through his word so that you would discern and receive the truth that is written here. Our God became human. He lived perfectly, he suffered, he died innocently, he rose powerfully, and now that same power and being lives in those who believe. The truth lives in the church of God. And love, God's love, agape love, flows through and from the truth living in us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for preserving these letters and for ensuring that they would arrive in our hands to minister to our minds and our hearts and our souls and our bodies. Thank you. And we ask, Lord, that as a church, we would be quick to respond to the nudgings and convicting of your Holy Spirit. That we would walk in your will and delight in your ways to the glory of your name. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.